You know, I mentioned earlier in the show uh, one Woody Keeble. Um, Master Sergeant Woody Keeble was someone that my first memory of was from my father. And uh, Woody Keeble spent a lot of time at the Wapton Indian School when I was young. And my father would always point to him and say, that is a national hero. Uh, and this was the same man, my father, that I looked upon as a hero because he had served in World War II. And, and he would just look at Woody Keeble and he said, there's no one around here that did uh, what Master Sergeant Keeble did on behalf of uh, this country, the price that he paid. And so just getting to see him and, and know that he was around meant a lot to me. And then there became a point in my life where I started raising the question and I pounded and pounded and pounded and I helped out any way I could uh, with individuals to get Woody Keeble in the Rough Rider Hall of Fame. And I'm proud of the work that we all did on that because Woody Keeble belongs in the North Dakota Rough Rider Hall of Fame. He's that type of hero. He's no longer with us, uh, but his stepson is. Russell Hawkins will be uh, the one that speaks at North Dakota's uh, cemetery. Uh, it's Veterans Cemetery this weekend on Memorial Day, and, and Russell is good enough to share some time with us today. Russell, good to have you coming down the road with us. Thank you. I'm here. You bet. I've got you, Russell. I, I just I went... I got to ask this, you know, what do you think of? I, I just mentioned what I think of uh, whenever Woody Keeble's mentioned. What do you think of when, when you think of your father? I think he was a great man. And uh, I'm finding out so much more about him after he's passed on. And uh, I sit and I realized how all this time I I was sitting in the same room with such greatness and I didn't even know it. I want to, I want to make sure we give uh, some of the facts to people uh, about Woody Keeble. Now um, he was recognized as a man with quiet courage and large presence. Woody was not a small man uh, in world war II, He proved his heroism as a, he fought through the South Pacific Island campaigns, uh, which earned him his first bronze star two purple hearts and the combat infantry badge. And then, you know what? Uh, many would have said, I'm done with my service to this country. I served. Uh, but when the Korean War uh, began, he reenlisted. He did. Uh, and he was assigned a Company G 19th Infantry Regiment, uh, 24th Division, where he earned another Purple Heart, a Bronze Star Medal with V, Valor uh, device. Also, Silver Star and a Distinguished Service Cross, but not the Medal of Honor. And that's when a lot of people kicked in. Uh, that's when they did. Uh, and, and Russell Hawkins was one of those individuals that said, this man, my father, deserves the Medal of Honor. And along with Mary Helm, who I had the privilege of working with on the Rough Rider Award, they got it done. They got Woody Keeble that uh, Medal of Honor. And uh, Russell, with all the work you put into that, what did that feel like to finally accomplish it? Well, when it finally happened, I thought I can die a happy man, that my life had a purpose, and uh, Woody would get the honor that he deserved. I, I want to get an insight into this man that you have. Uh, it, it's one thing to, to read uh, things like this off and to show how heroic he was and, and the price that he spent on behalf of our country. But the man behind all of that, that you knew, what was he like? He was very kind hearted. He was a very gentle spirited person. He was very humble. And if you did not know his war record, you would think he was just maybe a very humble, uh, um, introverted person. He would always sit in the back of the room, in the corner. He would never try to sit to the front. He never brought a presence to himself. Always a quiet observer, always very thoughtful. Um, many times uh, w w uh, when we were in Wapton, North Dakota, with the heavy winters and snow, there would be people stuck in a snowbank. And Woody, without saying a word, he'd check the traffic, he'd pull over, he'd get out of his car, and he'd just walk up to that car, grab it by the back bumper, and just push it out of the snow. And uh, people would thank him and want to do something. He'd just smile and wave. And uh, when, when I met him, he had already suffered his seventh stroke, so he was unable to speak. 
He could write notes, and then we could read about the brave deeds that he did. And uh, as a young boy, I, I read about him. And and uh, but outside of his war record, he was very thoughtful. He was actually a great cook. He would uh, really cook me up some big hamburgers when I would come home for lunch uh, in uh, fifth grade and sixth grade. Uh, he was very thoughtful and very kind. Uh, I would forget to leave my sh uh, shoes outside in the rain. I'd remember them, and they were all full of mud. The next morning, they were all dried and polished. He would get up in the night. He would see that I left my shoes out. He'd clean off the mud, dry them off, and polish them. Very kind, very thoughtful. He was known that way in Wapton, too. I know that you know that. Uh, in, in the Wapton community, one of the places that we always met to go referee football was uh, the, the Wapton American Legion. And they had a wall dedicated to Woody Keeble there. Uh, they had a wall that those veterans who themselves had served in the military, uh, they had a wall that honored this great man. And when you, when you would say something, uh, going there to meet to go referee a football game, when you would, when you would ask one of those veterans that was there, you know, whether it be having a drink or just visiting or playing a game of cards, and, and you'd get them to talk about Woody Keeble. Quite frankly, Russell, they'd say exactly what you just said, that he was quiet, that this great big man had a great big heart. And they said, you know what? You were never really going to get to know him uh, the way you should have got to know him with everything he had done. So I'll back you up on that. Uh, let, let me ask you this, Russell. How beat up was he? I mean, when, when you're winning Purple Hearts and Medals of Valor and, you know, for example, how many times was Woody shot? He was shot six different times with the rifle. Um, he was shot uh, alongside the head uh, when he took out the three pillboxes on Hill 765 when he, he ultimately received the Congressional Medal of Honor. On his uh, solo attack, uh, the fourth attack, uh, he, his helmet was shot right off. The bullet hole entered his helmet above his left ear and exited in the back uh, towards his neck, left a deep scar alongside his head. He was shot there. Uh, then on his third attempt, I'm kind of going backwards, his third attempt up the hill with third platoon, he took a bullet right through the chest on the right side. And so just on, on uh, hill 765, he took a bullet through the chest and uh, then he took a bullet alongside the head. And then in uh, uh, Korea, he was... Uh, uh, in the Pacific, Guadalcanal, he was shot uh, in the uh, right shoulder, his first engagement with the Japanese. He, uh, everyone took cover. They walked into a Japanese ambush. Uh, everyone took cover, everyone except Master Sergeant Keeble. He walked out into the open with his BAR, and he fired three magazines of 20-round uh, uh, per magazine. He was on his fourth magazine when a rifleman shot him through the right shoulder, knocked him down. Uh, he went down hard, but he got back up with the BAR, finished the engagement, and that was kind of a, a, a trademark of his. He would never take cover. He would stand out into the open and let the enemy shoot at him. Well, and uh, he was shot then through this right shoulder. He was shot twice in the left arm. Uh, he was shot uh, uh, twice uh, up at um, uh, Kill 765. And then he, he was saving a, a wounded soldier in... Um, in the Pacific at Guadalcanal, and he took a bullet through the back. And that particular story, one man went out and was wounded, and he was still alive. A GI went out to save him, and he was wounded and went down. And then Woody went out and brought them both back. And when he got bringing them both back, he took a bullet through the back. So he was shot six times with a rifle, and then he was hit seven different times with uh, uh, shrapnel grenades. Um, so he was hit 13 times in all. He did receive thir three Purple Hearts, but in a perfect world, he should have got he should have got uh, 13 Purple Hearts. That's amazing. Uh, did when you were doing research on this, did you know that? Did you know that he had been shot that many times? Did you did you know? No, I didn't. Uh, some, a lot of this was eyewitnesses. Now, as a young boy, I know he was shot twice in the left arm because I could see the the uh, the scars in his left arm. And uh, I remember I was just learning how to shoot a gun myself. And I would pull the bullet, I would pull the trigger to the right and uh, instead of squeezing it. And I'd always hit to the right of my target. And I remember at the breakfast table one time when he's sitting there with the short sleeves on and I was 
at practice and I saw the two bullet holes through his left arm. And I said, Woody, I think the guy shooting, now remember, I'm a little guy now, I'm not like an uh, adult. And I said, Woody, I think the guy shooting you was right-handed. I think he was aiming at your heart. And I think he pulled the trigger instead of squeezed the trigger. Because both these uh, bullet holes are very close to each other, but they were two separate battles. And I think they were both right-handed shooters that were shooting at you. And they were aiming at your heart, but instead they, they got you on the left arm because they were right-handed and they pulled the trigger. And anyway, that was just my observation. And then the scar alongside his head just looked like a piece of uh, fishing string pushed against his scalp real hard, like an invisible fishing string. It was just a deep crease. And that was, uh, that was, um, that was a rifleman who got him there. Yeah, but a lot of this we found out by eyewitnesses. You know, when we come back, I want to hear what that was like to hear from eyewitnesses, to, to speak to the men who served with him. So please stick around. Russell Hawkins, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have more conversation about Woody Keeble when we come back. If you were with us in the last segment, I'll absolutely guarantee you didn't leave us. Uh, you're hanging in there because this conversation that Russell Hawkins is bringing is absolutely fascinating. Uh, Russell is the guest speaker at the North Dakota Veterans Cemetery. He's the stepson of one Woody Keeble, a uh, military hero and, and someone who nationwide uh, is a, a, a poster child for what you can do if you have the determination and the grit to do as a soldier. Uh, and, and Russell is his stepson. So, um, Russell, I, I need to know from you what his fellow troops thought of him, what, what stories they had. Okay, I'll, I'll be happy to share that with you. Um, I can tell you that uh, uh, I'll start with... Uh, Frank Plata, who was with 3rd Platoon, he was uh, one of the individuals pinned down by the triangular crossfire by the three pillboxes. He saw Woody in action. He fought with him uh, not only on this engagement, but in other in engagements. Frank Plata was a lifer. He fought in World War II. He fought in Korea. He was a Silver Star recipient, Purple Heart recipient. He said Master Sergeant Keeble was the bravest man he ever saw. And there was no man he respected more than Master Sergeant Woody Keeble. And after he had been in numerous engagements with him, and he was not part of the tribe, he was not part of the Midwest, he was, I think, from the East Coast, he said, there's only two people he puts in front of Master Sergeant Woody Keeble. And he said, one was George Washington, and the other was Abe Lincoln, and then it was Woody Keeble. He said there was no greater soldier that he'd ever met, no one who commanded more respect and he was he was with Woody on seven on Hill 765 he was an eyewitness to what he did that's what Frank Plata said uh, uh, one interesting person one new development that we had was from Joe O'Connell Joe O'Connell was not with George Company he was not first second or third platoon George Company they were the ones engaged on Hill 765 Joe O'Connell was with Howe Company he was on the next boundary hill but he had a bird's eye view of everything and he was, he was manning uh, his uh, M1917 Browning machine gun, a water-cooled machine gun. And when he saw, he saw the three, three attempts to take out the pillboxes all fail. He saw three platoons go up, and then he saw all three retreated back. And then he couldn't believe his eyes. He said one big GI was going to go up against the whole mountain by himself. And when that became apparent that he was going to attack the trenches, and now Joe said these trenches were trenches that went completely around the mountain. There were transportation trenches filled with enemy soldiers completely around the mountain, one at the base, one at the middle, and then the three pillboxes on top. And he saw one man gonna attack all of them by himself. He just turned his water-cooled machine gun towards the enemy positions and he burned up three belts. And I said, Joe, how many rounds to a belt? And he said, 250. I said, so you burned up 750 rounds? And he said, yes. He said, Master Sergeant Keeble approached that first trench. He opened up with his BAR, which was the same caliber as Joe's uh, water cool machine gun, killed a number of troops, and then rushed forward and jumped into the trench with the rest of the enemy soldiers. And then all, all Joe could hear was the BAR, which was the same caliber of his Browning, his Browning 1917. And then he'd hear the enemy guns. Then he'd hear the BAR. Then he'd hear the enemy guns. Then he'd hear the BAR. Then the enemy guns. And then just the BAR. 
And then he, he said he didn't know what he keeled, but he said then this big GI got out of that first trench at the base of the mountain, which went completely around the mountain, having killed all the soldiers in that first trench. Now he moved towards the second trench. But now the entire enemy soldiers directed their firepower upon him with grenades, machine gun fire, rifle fire. He said the grenades coming down off the mountain looked like flocks of blackbirds. And they, they hit right in front of Woody, knocked him down. He thought they got him. He thought, oh, they got him with the grenade. And then Woody got back up again. Start another grenade would hit him beside him, knock him down. And he'd think, oh, they got him for sure. And he'd get up again. Later, they would take 83 pieces of shrapnel out of Woody. But Woody got to the second trench again with his BAR. He cleared an area of enemy soldiers, jumped up, ran towards that trench and jumped into the trench with the rest of the remaining enemy soldiers. And this is Joe O'Connell's account as an eyewitness. And then he said he couldn't see anyone. He'd just hear the BAR, then he'd hear the enemy guns, the BAR, then the enemy guns, then just the BAR. And Woody had killed everybody in that first trench and the second trench. And these were transportation trenches that went completely around the mountain filled with enemy soldiers. Then he got to the pillboxes. He took the, he used the trench as a defensive position and took the first pillbox out from the front with a grenade. And then he got back down on the trench low and he went to the left and took out the second pillbox with the grenade from the front. And that left the remaining pillbox on top. He used the trench and went around the back of the mountain, came up in the back of the pillbox and destroyed that with a grenade going through the back door. Then we didn't know this either. But the eyewitnesses said there were six or uh, some said six, some said seven. I used the number seven, seven remaining enemy soldiers, all in hidden positions. They grabbed their weapons and they just all rushed Master Sergeant Keeble uh, after he'd taken out the two trenches in the three pillboxes. And one BAR man, he was uh, at the base of the mountain and he told me at, at the Medal of Honor ceremony before and he said, all this time, Master Sergeant Keeble had his uh, BAR on a 600 round rate of fire. And he said when the last seven men attacked him, he switched it to a 300 round rate of fire. Now, I'm telling you that because that's what an eyewitness told me. He thought it was important enough to tell me, so I'm telling you. Would he switched his BAR to the slower rate of fire, 300 rounds, and then he killed the last remaining attacking seven, uh, seven soldiers. And so... Uh, the first guy up the mountain was Mario Izzoni. And Mario said what was so eerie, he said, is everybody was dead. Everybody in that first trench, all the enemy soldiers, dead. Everyone in the second trench, all dead. Everyone in the pillboxes, dead. The last remaining soldiers, dead. He said, usually there's wounded. Usually there's somebody moaning and, or, and, and calling out, trying to surrender. Uh, but he said, everybody was dead. He said, it was really eerie. And Master Sergeant Keeble was sitting on a huge rock leaning against his BAR. And Mario ran up to him, said, are you okay, are you okay? And Woody didn't answer, but Mario unzipped his jacket and he just saw him covered with blood. The bullet hole through his chest, later 83 pieces of shrapnel taken out of him, bleeding from the head where the bullet grazed and opened up his scalp above his ear. And uh, Mario said, I just stayed with him. I would not leave him. He said, <laughs> I stayed with him and I counted every piece of shrapnel they took out. They took out 83 of them. Yeah. Uh, Russell, I have to ask you this in the minute I have left here. Um, what does he mean to the tribe, to the Siston Wapton tribe? He not only means something to the tribe, but all the Sioux Nation. He epitomizes the cultural values of the Dakota Lakota people that they are uh, bravery. Uh, courageous, humble, and, and generous. Those were qualities that were esteemed by the Dakota Lakota culture. And Woody epitomized those. He was generous, he was modest, and he was brave. There's a reason that Russell Hawkins is sitting here right now visiting with us uh, with a master's degree in public administration from the University of South Dakota. And something tells me, Russell, Woody, we, Woody would be awful, awful proud of that. Thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you for speaking at the North Dakota Veterans Ceremony or Cemetery ahead of time. And thank you for sharing time with us here on Beck News. Thank you for remembering Master Sergeant Woody Keeble. You bet.